It is Wednesday afternoon Bible class, April 7th, and we are starting a brand new study. It is an exciting study. This is called the Gospel in the Stars. And if you've never heard it before, be prepared to have your mind blown. It is fascinating and exciting. And if you have heard, you're back for a second dose because you know how exciting it is to hear it and to see it. I want to make very clear right from the start. We have absolutely nothing to do with astrology. Hmm. Nothing. That's Satan's counterfeit. That comes out of the pit of hell. I am not teaching astrology and I will not get near even a horoscope. That is forbidden in scripture. That is displeasing to our Lord. We'll look at its inception, but this is not what our study is. Our study is on the astronomy of God. So here the difference between our words, astrology comes out of the occult. Astronomy is a scientific revelation of the gospel as given to us in the word of God. I'm going to lay down scripture for you in the beginning so that you can see the premise that we are building on, where we come from, and understand this is not man-made, it's not man's doctrine, it's not fables that we're told to stay away from, and above all, it is not, nothing occultish or uh, going to glorify or send you in the direction of um, the, the astrology that um, dupes so many people, so many people. From Adam, Adam to Moshe, Moses we have between, well, let's just round it off and just say 2,500 years. And we know Moshe was the author of the first five books. Now, uh, when we're in Genesis, I'll show you that there was a, a compilation going on, and Moshe is the one that, that brought together, also wrote, and how we can see and understand that. But really, for all sake and purposes, what I'm bringing to you is there was not the written word available to the common people. It, even if it was being compiled, the records being passed down, it was not known as the Word of God and given in that way at this time. So without any written word to guide them to know about God, who God is and how to know God, how did they know? And how do we know they knew? How do we get where we get with our history if they weren't able to pick up a Bible, go to their local bookstore, Bible <laughs> bookstore, you know, choose the, the flavor they want. By that, I mean the um, version that they want. You know, I mean, we are so, or I am, anyway, so spoiled. I have multitude Bibles that I can, you know, look at. And if you've got a computer, you've got everything at your fingertips. But this is prior to all of that. And I know you know that. When we go all the way back, there wasn't such a thing as the computer. <laughs> But we have indication in scripture. Enoch, one of the early ones, knew. He knew a lot. He, he knew about the Lord returning with his saints. Jude, Jude refers to that. We'll look at scripture references in time. But the comment was made that they knew the Lord would return with 10,000s of his saints. I have to wonder how many people were alive in Enoch's day. Was 10,000 more than the number of people? Or was it a great majority of them, you know, and to think that that many are going to be with the Lord, that, that had been amazing. But I will tell you clearly, <coughs> from the garden to today, God has never left humanity without a way to know the truth. Absolutely. He has never been silent where anyone can ever say the period of time I lived in, I was unable to know. Not that's taken off the table. How can we take that off the table? How can I step out and say that? I can tell you very clearly that God put the gospel message in the heavens. Is there any human being alive from Adam to us who has not lived under those heavens? No. We all live under those heavens, and those heavens tell the story from virgin birth to eternal reign. And I will take you through the study that will show you that. I want you to see it is found in the scripture, not some idea that some man got and we're following some man. I say that because there are whole cults that follow 
Oh, I got direct revelation from God. This is what he said. Here's how we're to live, what we're to do. If you don't have cults popping up in your mind right now that I'm describing, then you haven't been exposed. But believe me, they're out there. So let's go to the Word of God and let me go to one of the, the clearest passages. And for those of you who've heard this part before, I hope it still just thrills your soul to be in the Word and see it in a complete study today in this way together because um, don't let it, it become callous to you. Don't, oh yeah, I know that. No, ask the Lord to take you deeper and show you even more uh, if you're aware of this beginning. Go with me to the very beginning, a very good place to start. <laughs> we're going to Genesis, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 15. Specifically, we're going to go to verses 5 and 6. Okay, so Genesis 15, verses 5 and 6. I think I need to move things just in case. I have another class member. Um, okay. Now, background to jump in at verse 5, we've got Avram, Avraham, and we've got, actually here he's still Avram, he's not even Avraham yet, which by the way, side note, but when his name is changed, the extra letter that's put in in the Hebrew Olive Bay, put together with his other letters before and after that, tell us that God was cutting covenant with Avram when he turned his name from Avram to Avraham. It's not that, it, oh, he's going to be this, it, it was true too, that he's going to be the father of many nations, but that wasn't the crux of that name change. Why they give it that meaning is a misnomer. That's not the meaning from the Hebrew. Back on track, this is who we're talking about though, and he's being told, he had been told, he'd been told probably about 20 years earlier than this passage of scripture, that he would be the father of a great nation, and he still has no child. Now, how many of you have ever, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever had the Lord tell you something, you know in your heart that he's told you this is going to happen, and then it seems like silence, dead silence, and a long period of time goes on, and your faith may begin to question, did I hear him right? Am I, you know, is, is this true? You know, you may, but God's testing your faith. Are you going to take him at what he says and believe him or not? And I'll tell you honestly, if Avram and his wife had stayed with God's original plan, we wouldn't have some of the bloodshed we've had over the thousands of years. And I wonder how much they regretted the door they opened by impatience running forward. So just a word for all of us to take to heart. If God's promised it, stand on it. You see it in the Word of God, stand on it. When it's silent for a long time, stand on it. When it gets too hard to stand, kneel. K-N-E-E-L. Kneel. Go back in prayer. Plug in. Press in. God will be faithful to his word. So, God had told Avram like 20 years prior, you're going to be the father of a huge nation. And he's still going childless. And time's marching on. And even though they lived longer then, the years of fertility, you know, we don't read that they gave birth to children at 800 years old. So, you know, his, his body's waning, his wife's waning, and, and he's, he's asked about it. He's basically asked, well, I've got Eliezer, my servant, and in that day a servant could be adopted in like a son. Is it supposed to be through him? And God is assuring um, Avram, no, it's not going to be through your servant. It's going to be through you, through your very loins. Okay, that's up to verse 4 now. This one that will come, that the nation's going to come from, this one will be uh, from your very own body. Now, after reassuring him of that, he takes him outside. So that tells me they were talking in the tent. I love that. The Lord comes right into our presence. We know that, that when we have him in our heart, we're the, his temple. He is inside us talking with us. You don't have to go to church to hear the voice of God. You don't have to go to to a group study. You have the ability one-on-one -on -one where you are when you've opened your heart to hear him. So, Avram and he took a little out the door. <laughs> and God's taking him to see the heavens. Verse 5, he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. Okay? He's going to go on, by the way. Let me make clear. I, I think I said it, but let me make clear. Through his heir is going to come 
a nation, actually he's going to be the father of nations, but through him specifically, there was going to become one who would be a blessing to the entire world. This was the promised Messiah, and this was given early on. Okay, so with that background now, when we read in verse 5, count, the Hebrew is a word that means to count, but it doesn't mean just one, two, three, which, by the way, when we realize how many stars and what the sky must have looked like with no pollution and no electric lights to block it, there must have been millions of stars in view. So if Avram was being told to count one, two, three, I think he would have looked at God, shrugged, and said, I give up, yeah. you know, I give up. But the Hebrew means more than just a count like that. It means recount or relate. Or the idea even is make a list, narrate, enumerate. All of these are the word, the same Hebrew word. Inscribe, record, declare. Declare is going to be key, okay? So now when he says count the stars, if you can count them, both times that word counts, the same in the Hebrew. So narrate the stars if you can narrate them. Recount the stars if you can recount them. Declare the stars if you can declare them. There's something here that we're beginning to see. Okay, so the stars are telling something. It's no longer just one, two, three, four. There's more of a meaning here. Now, how do we look at scripture? When we see a scripture like this and we want to know more and we wonder, are we getting the right idea here? Then we're going to look for scripture to back up scripture. The Word of God is never contrary. The Word of God never contradicts itself. And the Word of God will reveal the truth. We will see it in more than one place. We love two or three witnesses. Let a thing be established. So, let's see if we see anything else about the stars counting, the stars declaring, the stars telling. Do we see that anywhere else in Scripture? And because I want to give us a shortcut, I'm going to give you the answer. Go with me, and we will come back to Genesis so you don't have to, um, you know, keep a marker there. I'll just put it that way. Go with me now to Psalm 19. This is where it starts to get really exciting to me. I love this. Okay, are you ready? If you haven't heard, are you ready to have your mind blown? Psalm 19, and we're going to start with verse 1. And we have the heavens, and if you have a translation that's close to the Hebrew, you have the word, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, you might have the heavens tell of the glory of God, but declare is a little stronger, a little closer to the Hebrew, and it just happens to be the very same word that I was talking to you about in Genesis 15.5. Okay? So in 15.5, when it says, count the stars, declare the stars, now we have Psalm 19.1 saying the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay? Some can even go so far with the Hebrew and really in essence say the heavens are proclaiming the glory of God. Okay? That fits right into context. If that stays noisy, I'll close the door. So, rather than you flip back to verse uh, Genesis 15.5, let me tell you when he was told to count the stars and narrate them if he could, then he was told, so shall thy seed be. Okay? Now, many scriptures, many translations don't use that word seed anymore. They use the word offspring, and that's okay, but I kind of like to go back to the original, zera in the Hebrew, and realize this is used somewhere else, and I think when we use the word seed, we see it a little more clearly. Offspring is their seed, so we're not off track, but I, I just think it's a little more clear. The reason being, and I'm going to flip there real quick, we're coming back to Psalm, we're coming back to Genesis, I'm going to make your fingers do some work today if you like to turn with me. We're going to run real quickly to Galatians 3.16 because that tells us why it's important that we're seeing this word seed in a singular manner. That somehow, as the stars are declaring so shall Avram's seed be. And remember, he's just been told he's going to have an heir from his own loins, and out of that would come one who would bless all the nations. Okay? Galatians 3.16 gives us more insight on that. 
And it says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham. So we're right on the same track. We're talking about what God was promising Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis. Now we're reading about it in Galatians 3. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And here it uses the word seed. I think all the translations use it, okay? Notice how it gets very specific. The author of Galatians, I believe to be Shaul Paul, says he does not say and to seeds as one way in referring to many, but rather as in referring to one and to your seed. So he's speaking of a specific one, and then it's as if Paul doesn't want to leave that even open for question. He's going to spell it out. He's making it as clear as he can, and so he says, that is, or that seed is, and your translation will say Christ. Christ is the English translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So now we've got declared in Genesis 15, 5, declare the stars tell the story the stars are telling narrate that story psalm 19 tells us it's declaring or <coughs> proclaiming the glory of god abram's being told your seed that will bless the world is coming through this one and that seed specifically is messiah and we know messiah came out of the line of abraham yitzhak isaac Yaakov, Jacob, down through David, and continued on following, coming out of the line of the tribe of Judah, where the kings were to come from, at the order of priesthood out of Melchizedek, not out of Aharon, so that we see this one is the perfect answer to be the seed that would bless the whole world. So we get our whole picture when we look at Genesis and we look at Psalm and we look at Galatians, we follow it down and we know Genesis is speaking to us about Messiah's coming through Abraham that would bless the world, okay? But we're going to see a little more depth than that. I, that could still be too open as far as someone could come and say, yeah, well, that's your idea of putting that together. But let's nail this down some more. If we're narrating, a narrator tells the narrator comes into the story continually to fill in the blanks that need to be known for the story to make sense. As the story is being enacted out, the narrator is giving us those details that are needed. So as we see the narration of the stars, we're going to see the fulfillment of God's promise. We're going to see this lineage. We're going to see the seed as singular. We're going to see, again, that the heavens are declaring or proclaiming. And when I say the heavens, we can get specific and say the stars are declaring or proclaiming the glory of God. Now, if this is true, and it points all the way to Messiah, to the one who would bless the whole world via salvation, the key to salvation, now we begin to see how I could say in my opening that God never left this world without the testimony of how that we can know God, how we can know the truth, how we can have a relationship with God. It didn't have to wait until... 1611 when King James made this more available to us. It didn't have to wait till our generation to where it could be written in, in earlier generations where it could be written in language to be understood. You didn't have to know Hebrew now. You didn't have to know Greek. No, God gave it all the way back. And we know that God showed to the Jewish people in particular that he being the creator God that every Shabbat we're told to remember that he showed from that creation his wanting that intimate relationship with his creation. And how can he have that except through the one who said, no man comes unto the Father but through me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And we know those words were spoken by Yeshua Jesus who claimed and was and is Messiah, Mashiach, Christ in our English, the one that we're seeing where Galatians spelled it out. The seed coming from Abraham that the stars are declaring that Psalm is telling you is the glory of God is none other than Messiah Yeshua Jesus. I think we're laying a very good foundation. It still gets a little better. I love it. Okay. So our heavens are declaring the glory of God. Let's pause and let's look at that phrase. 
Oh, somebody just gave me a, a glorious heavenly picture. Diana. It's their background. Diana, I love it. It's perfect for us. Anybody who can see it is perfect for us in our study right now. Just popped in. It's like the Lord's bringing it to life. It's just what I prayed for. Take it off the page, Lord, and put it in 3D and live. And I see your heart. I'm glad you heard, Diana. We love you and it too. Okay, so. If the heavens are narrating, the heavens are declaring, the heavens are telling a story, the heavens are supposed to be telling us, and it song tells us specifically, the glory of God, then we need to know what is the glory of God. And rather than we come up with our idea, our definition, let's get it right from God's word. I think he's, if he's telling us, he's declaring his glory, I think he's going to give us the best answer. So once again, we go to the word of God. Where do we see what scripture tells us who or what is the glory of God? And I will take you to Hebrews 1. I love the book of Hebrews. You are on all my favorites today. Although what part do I not love? <laughs> okay, Hebrews chapter 1. Background for Hebrews. Hebrews is a book written to the Hebrews. Wow, that took a genius to catch that, didn't it? <laughs> to understand that. But we have a generation just past the, the generation that Messiah walked on this earth. We have people that are still alive, but we have people that have been born now who did not see Messiah in his early life. After Messiah rose from the dead and they're beginning to get the complete picture, they're, they're becoming what we call today Messianic believers. They're believing in Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus as the Savior. And they were believing that this is what well, I'll say honestly, is was the roots of Judaism pointing to. What do I mean? Let me just take you to Passover real quick because we've just gone through that. We saw in Passover the picture of Messiah. We saw that the lamb that was sacrificed first for a man, Adam, for a, a family in, in, um, when they were to come out of Egypt, for the nation, when we see right there at the time when they're coming out of Egypt, and then we see the lamb in Scripture become the lamb for the world. When John said of Yeshua, uh, um, Yeshua, when I say Yeshua HaMashiach, your English is Jesus Christ. That's Jesus the Messiah. And it's not Jesus' first name, Christ's last name. It's title. Jesus who is the Christ. Jesus who is the Messiah. So all that Judaism has done, all the holy days, all the symbolism, all the talk of the Lamb, etc., every picture has been pointing to Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, who fulfilled everything perfectly that fit with all the prophecies and all the pictures. Didn't miss one detail. Not one scholarly, revered sage or rabbi can come up with one scripture that Messiah did not fulfill except for the ones that speak to what he will do in his second coming, when he will come to rule and reign. But in the first coming, dealing with the sin issue and coming for that purpose to suffer as a servant and die, raised from the dead, every, every prophecy for that was fulfilled. And we know everyone for his second coming will be fulfilled also. So having said that and seeing that this is all picture building toward, now the cross has happened. Now the Lamb of God has been slain. He rose from the dead, he took his blood, and he put it on the heavenly mercy seat to open up heaven for us so that we who come along later, and really from that day forward, when we would lose our earthly life, leave this body, shell out, <laughs> and go home, would go right into the presence of God because that blood <coughs> has opened the way. He is the way. This is the truth. He gives us life, an abundant living life with him. So as our Hebrew Christians, our believers, who we call Messianic today, Jewish Christians, all the names uh, really, if you boil it down and quit the arguing, they all mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. These people were looked at as followers of Messiah. They were often called the way, people of the way. Because Yeshua Jesus said, I am the way. So that, that was what they were called at first. And they were looked at as another sect of Christian, I'm sorry, another sect of Judaism. They were looked at, you had the Pharisees. Pharisees believed in an afterlife. You had your Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in an afterlife. Do you want to keep those two straight? 
The Pharisees were fair, I see, because they did believe in the afterlife. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the afterlife. Makes it real clear. You won't forget who's which. You had the Stoics. You had the Gnostics, those who are all about knowledge, science, get it in the head, no emotion. I mean, you had all these different sectors or sections or groups. And for a while there, they put in Jewish Christians right along with all the others. <coughs> But as Hebrews is written, by this point, they're catching that these people are a little bit different. They're no longer believing that they have to do the sacrificial system. They're not coming to make a sacrifice at the temple. And they're talking about having <coughs> had a better sacrifice, better blood, sinless blood, shed for them, put not on an earthly mercy seat, but on the heavenly mercy seat to procure the way open to Yehovah, Yahweh, God the Father for all time. So, the Jewish people who were holding on to the traditions and not accepting this, started to have an issue with those who did, who were not keeping all the, the law the way they thought they should. And they were literally beginning to be kicked out of the temple. Until this point, they could still go to the temple, they could go for their times of prayer, they could go worshiping God, they could go bringing in the, their first fruits and all of this, but now the boat's really rocking because now they're persona non grata, now they're being kicked out, and they're afraid that if they're outside of what was the commonwealth of Israel, if Messiah comes back and he comes back to Israel and they're on this outside because they've not been accepted now, will they miss out on the promises? Are they wrong? So this book was written to reassure them, don't go back to the Judaism of the shadows. Embrace the fulfillment. Recognize that it is right, and don't go past the safe harbor of salvation. This is your salvation. Yes, it is. Better blood, better sacrifice, not the blood of bulls and goats. This was the sinless Lamb of God who gave his life for the world. So it's reassuring them. So the... the author, and I'm refusing to give name only because I don't want to go into the controversy right now, but if you want to know what I believe, I'll tell you later. The author in the very beginning is laying down a foundation for his Jewish audience. That's why it's so important. Remember, he's talking to Jewish boys and girls, but you know, he's talking to the Jewish population who would have a background. So he starts off in verse one and says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers. Okay, who's the fathers? If you're Jewish and you're thinking Jewish, you're going to immediately say, that's Abraham, Yisach, and Yaakov. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. There are forefathers. I call them my fathers to this day. My generation still does. As soon as you say to anybody practicing Judaism today, and I mean Judaism that holds to the scriptures at all, and you talk to them about the fathers, boom, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're right there. Okay, so God spoke in Abram's day. Aren't we studying that in Genesis 15? Isn't God speaking to Abraham? This is what it's being referred to. Then it says that he went on past that. He spoke to the fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he spoke to them in the prophets. So by the time we have the prophets coming into Hebrews 1, verse 1, okay. by the time we come into the time <laughs> of the prophets, We've moved down from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we're seeing that God's passing his word through the prophets. The prophets gave us all those prophecies I just referred to that Yeshua Jesus had to fulfill every single one or he was not the Messiah. And we've talked about that before, right from the get-go. If he were not born in Bethlehem, he's discredited. And we've got the miraculous birth of Yeshua Jesus taking place not in his parents' <coughs> hometown, but in a town far down south from where his parents normally live and would have given birth. That happened because of a decree put out by a Gentile. So it's not a Jewish spin on the story, but God moved in that Gentile, that Roman Caesar, to put out a, a decree and they had to go. Okay, And every prophecy continues. God spoke through these prophets in many portions. We read portions every week. This is called the parasha. So again, our Jewish minds are alive and saying, okay, God speaks in our parashas. Well, our parashas come out of Genesis to Deuteronomy. The part of the scripture called the books of Moshe, the, the Torah, 
the first five books of what you call the Old Testament. I call the original just so that you don't think it's old as an antiquated. So, God spoke to us in those scriptures from Genesis to Deuteronomy. God spoke to us through Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob. God spoke to us in the prophets, the prophecies. That's many, many. That's Micha, Micah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos. I'm giving you the names of English only <coughs> just to hurry, but all the prophetic books spoke of this seed that Paul has specifically declared is Messiah. Okay? He did it in many ways. He gave pictures. He gave different kinds of examples. I mean, we have the Lamb of God, for one. We have the Lion of the tribe of Judah, for another. We have all these different ways, all through our own Jewish heritage brought down to us. And you're going to see why that's important when we go back to the stars in a moment, too. But in verse 2, it says, In these last days, in the author's time, the last days, in recent time, he could say, has spoken to us, God has spoken to us, in this, just the last little bit here now, in his son. Okay, that nails it. God the son we know is the one that we call Yeshua, Jesus. So we know that, that we're being told God's spoken to us through these many ways and means through all of these years, <laughs> down through the quarter of time to, let's just say, let's just say in the 60s AD, okay? And now he's spoken to us in his son. And they could recall that the son had just been living an earthly life in his flesh. Now he tells us about this son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Okay, and we know that God said that the son will inherit everything. That's in Romans, okay? Through whom he also made the world. Well, when we know our Genesis, our Bereshit, our very first verse, Bereshit, bara Elohim, we have in the beginning God's created, singular verb, created by a plurality. We see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three moving in the act of creation. So did Yeshua create the world? Yes. Does Colossians 1.15 <coughs> through about 17 declare that Yeshua is the one? It says that nothing was made by him, nothing was made that wasn't made by him. So we're keeping all of our scriptures, it's all coming together. He's just making it concise and bringing it all into one paragraph for us. This one, this son, who in recent days he's talked to us by the fulfillment of the prophets, by the fulfillment of those portions of scripture, by the fulfillment of what he told to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And in our case right now, we're especially interested in what God told Abraham that was fulfilled in the son and how we're to see and know that back in Abraham's day. Because Abraham didn't live in 65 AD. Abraham couldn't look back to the prophets. They hadn't written yet. They hadn't lived yet. He didn't have all this. But as time marched on, it's like God just keeps giving another proof and another proof and another proof and another proof that, this, that what we are declaring is the truth. And that is that God the Son is the Messiah, is the Savior of the world, and the way to God is through Him. And the Gospels are going to, I'm, I'm sorry, the Gospel and the Stars is going to be declaring that because what is the Gospel? The Gospel is the good news of the salvation Yeshua brings to the world. So if the Gospel is in those stars, if they were able to see and know His story through the stars, they are able to know God intimately and personally like God said I wanted from day one when I created Adam in my image so that he could have a relationship with me, which he didn't do for anything else. <coughs> he didn't do that for the trees. He didn't do it for the birds in the sky. He didn't do it for the fishes in the sea, and he didn't do it for the animals on the land, but he did it for man. Man was made special in his image so that God could connect with him and have that intimate relationship. So with all of this in mind, that it is through the Son who he's appointed heir of all things, who's made the world. Verse 3 now is our key verse. Remember, we're looking for <coughs> what is the glory of God. Verse 3 says, and he is the radiance of his glory. Okay, radiance, what does that mean? Well, if somebody says, wow, you're radiating, 
What are they saying? It's like you're glowing. It's like you're you're just all lit. You know, this is bright. This is beautiful. You're re you're reflecting a, a light somehow. So what he's saying is, he, the sun, is the the light, the radiance, the glory of God Himself, because He's the radiance of His glory, God's glory. So who is the glory of God? Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, Savior. He is the one who is radiating the glory of God, shining it, telling it. He's the billboard or the, the lighthouse, whatever you want to call it. He, this is the glory that's coming out. It's very God himself in the person of the Son. So the heavens are declaring Yeshua the glory of God. That's what we're being told. It's all right there. And if you don't believe me, look at the rest of verse 3. And the exact representation of his nature, this one who is showing his glory, who's radiating the glory of God, is the exact representation of who God is and upholds all things by the word of his power. Okay? So it's telling us he is the exact and I can't even use the word copy because as soon as you say copy, it's lost something. It's not exact anymore. It's a copy. He's more than that. He is the exact replication, he is, which means copy. So I'm still, there's no word for it, okay? Our, our vocabulary is too earthly to get this. But when you look in a mirror and you think you're seeing your exact opposite, you're not. You're getting very close. Well, Yeshua, Jesus, is even closer than that in being the glory of God so that we could see it. Remember when God became visible? He put on a face, slipped into time and space, put on a face, and we call him Yeshua, Jesus. Remember our matzah in our staff, in our Passover Seder? Three parts, we see it as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Two parts, the top and the bottom, are never brought out through the whole ceremony. They're hidden in there before it starts, and they're hidden in there when it ends. God was before. God is after. The Holy Spirit was before. The Holy Spirit was after. The Son also was before, and the Son is after. But the Son is the one who slipped into time and space and put on the face and became the visible face of God, <coughs> the glory of God. And we see that when that middle piece of moss is the one that is pulled out, and is, we see that that's the one that comes into view, and that one, if you follow it through, the stripes, the piercing, the bruising, the broken, the, the half buried, all are to eat from it. Later, it, it's found, brought out. The one who finds it gets the prize. We know it's a picture of the one who finds Yeshua, finds a prize of eternal life. There couldn't be a better picture of Messiah. There couldn't be a better picture of this one, again, how he spoke in portions and in different ways to reveal to us this is the glory of God. And so now we know the heavens should be declaring Yeshua Jesus. They should be declaring who he is, telling us his story. That's what we should see. And as we go through the gospel and the stars, I think that you will, without exception, totally agree that it does tell his entire story. I'm going to show you virgin birth in the stars. I'm going to show you his, his time of birth in the stars. I'm going to show you his suffering um, burial, resurrection in the stars. I'm going to show you his coming back to rule and reign in the stars. It tells his story. It declares the glory of God. It narrates it. It answers what we're being told in, in Genesis verse 5. Okay, 15, sorry, chapter 15, verse 5. Let's go back there real quick with all this fresh in our mind and let's look at verse 6. Right after um, 5 where we have just said um, I guess I left out one part. Let me say it, okay? You look toward the heavens, count or declare the stars if you're able to declare them. And he said to me, so shall your, oh, we did that. So shall your descendants be, but it actually should say, so shall your seed be. We saw that seed in Galatians 3 was Yeshua Jesus. So what did Abraham do with all this? And remember, God took him outside of his tent to show him the stars. God didn't just tell him, oh, I'm going to reveal this. He's showing it. 
I think this took a little bit of time. I don't think this happened in five minutes. I think God pointed to this constellation and said, here's what this is telling. And then he pointed to another, and then he pointed to another, and he took Abraham through far enough for him to know the story, to know that this one would be <coughs> the seed that would bless the world, the seed that could save the world. How did Abraham respond? Wow, you know, this is a far-fetched story. This is a fable, Lord. This is a great fairy tale. Now give me something that's true. <laughs> no. He saw it so clearly that it says, then he believed in the Lord. You notice that key word. I emphasized it on purpose. It didn't just say he believed the Lord. Oh, I believe you. I believe what you're saying. No, it says he believed in in the Lord. Hmm. That means he is believing in the salvation of the Lord. He is believing in this fact that what he's just been shown in the stars, one will come. His name will be Yeshua Jesus. He will save us from our sins. He will open the way to living in heaven with our God forever. He is declaring to us the glory of our God. Wow! This is exciting. <laughs> this is real and something we can sink our teeth into. So Abraham believed in the Lord. Believe also means trust it. It, it, it means I'm staking my claim on it. I tell you, write the check and take it to the bank. You'll be able to cash it. It's, it's valuable and it's there. And the Lord, the word for Lord here is Yehovah. It is Yahweh. It's not this, it, for a moment, is it saying that Abraham trusted in the promise, okay? Because people say, oh, he trusted in the promise that he was going to be the father of a great nation, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Well, hello. Let's look at that thought and see the fallacy of that. Because when does believing you're going to be a big family get you righteous? That's not righteous. Righteous is coming into the robe of Yeshua Jesus' work for us. It's taking off our sin-filled garments, our dirty garments, what we have stained. Our righteousness is filthy rags. It's taking that off and putting on His robe of righteousness, which says that we are washed in His blood, which means we are cleansed from that sin and brought into salvation, into saving faith by believing in not a promise of a nation, of a big group of people, but the promise believing in Yeshua, believing in, or in this case, believing in Jehovah and his promise of the one who would reveal his glory, Yeshua the Son. So we now see Abraham believed <coughs> in the Lord, and that is what brought him righteousness. He believed in God himself. He believed not in a promise, but in the one giving the promise. And now we hear at 16.31, Believe in the Lord, and you shall be saved. Salvation does not come in any other form. It comes in the name of the one called Yeshua Jesus. Amen. That's salvation. That's what this is declaring. <coughs> That's what it's revealing. And is that not God being revealed, the glory of God being expressed, we begin to see a face and understand, and we can come into that relationship with him now because we're putting our faith in him. I think that's pretty exciting. And oh, by the way, the, the name Yehovah is so Jewish for our Jewish people. It comes from Shemot, Exodus 3.14. It is where we get our original I am. And that statement, no matter how hard I try, can never, in English, hold its full value. Because in it is talking about an <coughs> eternality that we can't get in one word. We use tenses. We say was, is, and will be. And we think we're rich, we've got three tenses. Well, I'll take you to Greek who has six tenses. And it doesn't even cover it. 
this is telling us that this one who is revealing himself is the one who was from eternity past, the one who will be in eternity future, and we can't understand that. But we take it by faith. Do you believe that you breathe in air to live? Oh, every single one of us is breathing in air right now. Pam's breathing in so much she's coughing on it. <laughs> if we didn't breathe in air, we wouldn't be alive. But can you see the air? No. But which one of you got worried about having enough air today and set up a prayer and said, God, please don't let us run out of air. Don't let that happen so that we can live through this day. Now, maybe if you get in an accident and you're confined in an area, you, you can have a, a panic and a worry. But in our normal everyday life, we don't, our faith is, is so sure, we trust it all the time. We don't think, I better store as much air as I can because there might not be enough for me next time, especially if I got a room full of people. You know, we just don't go there. This, that's not, you get my point. We can't see God, but he can be that real to us that we have no doubt, no fear, no worry, and we are not let down. That's what we're seeing here. Now, when God uses his name Jehovah, he is using the name that he ties in with the redemptive part of the deity. Okay? Elohim, the name that you hear when I say bara, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created or God's created, <coughs> that's Elohim. That's the creator God. But as soon as he's talking about redemptive work, he uses his name Jehovah. And when he thought, when he sought Adam and Eve, the first time he went looking for them after they had cut their relationship, they had disobeyed and it cut that relationship. Our scripture from the Hebrew tells us Jehovah Elohim went looking. For Adam and Eve. He knew they needed to be redeemed and he tells that he came in that form of redemption from square one, sin number one, that brought all the sin into the world, that, that brought it to all of us in our birth. You don't become a sinner, you're born a sinner. You don't have to teach little ones to be sinners. They're born that way. <laughs> they're born very selfish and self-centered. And, they're, you know, anybody who's raised anybody for the first couple of years of their life, <laughs> they'll attest to what I'm saying. But as soon as God knew, and it wasn't that God discovered. He knew what was going to happen. He had already planned the redemption plan before the first sin had happened. So as soon as it happened, he puts into our word, Yehovah Elohim went looking for them. Remember, he walked with them in the cool of the evening. That was nothing new. But when they needed redemption, he showed up in that capacity. We know that, that blood was shed. They were clothed with skins. That's why we know blood was shed as a picture of what Messiah would one day do, the Lamb of God who would shed sinless blood to not just cover sins, but wash them away, okay? We see that, that, that in Genesis 3, verses 8 and 21, the clothing and the covering, um, and we see that Jehovah is the one that made the original, the old covenant, I'll call it, because it is old, because there is a new covenant with Israel. That's the name he uses. That's Shmot, Exodus chapters 19 and 20. He uses the name Jehovah. Usually what you see in, in most translations is the capital L-O-R-D, and that's, that's Jehovah when you see that in your scripture. So again, when he's talking redemptively, he uses the distinctive name of deity that refers to him in that relation, in this case to Israel, because that, that's the part of scripture that we're studying. But I, I just want you to see redemption was planned before we were created. It was planned before the foundation of the world. We're told that, that, that he, in essence, died for us before the foundation of the world. So is it no surprise that the heavens are declaring that to us? They're bringing us that redemptive glory of our God that we can be in relationship with him. And furthermore, when I said in verse 6 it was counted for righteousness, let's look real quick at what that means in the book of Romans. 
Go with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to read real quickly verses 1 through 5. I'm going to tell you, read the chapter later, read 16 to 24 at least, if you <coughs> skip in the middle, but the whole chapter is a great chapter. But we're going to get there our insight to Abraham again. Remember, we like witnesses. We like scripture to help us understand scripture. So here's another one talking to us about Abraham. And it's right there in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, remember that sounds just like Hebrews, that sounds just like Genesis, so scripture is in line with scripture. Our forefather, according to the flesh, okay, in my flesh, I'm Jewish. Those are my forefathers. That's what, what he's saying, okay? So, what, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? What did Abraham find? Okay, what happened? For if Abraham was justified by works, he'd have something to boast about, but not before God. What's that mean? When we're talking about justification, that's being righteous in God's sight. It's just as if we hadn't sinned. Our sins have been forgiven. They've been washed away. They're forgotten by God, and he sees us closed in that righteousness of, <coughs> of the Lord himself. So this writer, who is Paul, is saying, if Abraham did this on his own, if he did it by works, then he'd have something to boast about. Hey, look at me. I got righteous. I got righteous because I did this and I did this and I believed that and I, you know, I, I got up on the right side of the bed and I, I crossed all my eyes and dotted all my t Oops. That's about how righteous we can be, okay? It should have been dotted the I's and crossed the T's. You know, we ate the right foods. We, we said the right things. No, none of that's true. We can never bring ourselves up to that holy, perfect standard of God. So did Abraham have something to boast about? No, he did not have something to boast about before God. For what does the scripture say? Verse 3, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Why was it credited? Because it hadn't happened yet. He saw in the stars the coming day of crucifixion and resurrection. So that sinless blood was given from a human because a human had to redeem the human race. An animal couldn't do it. A fish couldn't do it. Nature couldn't do it. It had to be a human to redeem a human. And Abraham saw that. He believed God. He believed in God, we know from Genesis. And that, God said, okay, I'm going to give you credit. I'm going to apply that to your account because I know by faith you are believing in that day. <clears throat> Remember somebody else said that too. His name was Job. Yoof in our Hebrew. And it said that he knew his Redeemer lives and that he would see the day of, of his Redeemer coming. Job lived at the same time as Abraham. Job knew also. So now we know it wasn't just God telling a secret to Abraham. He didn't just say, Abraham, come here. You're my favorite. I'm just going to tell you. No, he gave it to Abraham because Abraham is the father who is going to be teaching it, passing it down to the, the nations that are going to come that are eventually going to give birth to this one. But it also <coughs> was to whosoever's living under the stars. They had opportunity. They could know what the gospel, what our scriptures were going to say by seeing it in the stars. So... Uh, did I go through verse 5? No, I didn't. Let's go through verse 5. It, his faith, his believing in that day coming is what was credited to him for righteousness in verse 3, verse 4. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a favor, but what's to do? If you work, the pay you get is what you're due. That's not a favor. That's not credit. You earned it. Okay? But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, believes in Jesus, who justifies the, the unsaved one, his faith is credited as righteousness. So it makes it very clear. What counts for righteousness? Faith. Not works, faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8. Go on and read 9 also, tell you you're made to do God's work, that he, it, it, 
it gives all the credit to God, and that's where it, it is. But back on track, Abraham is now believing in the resurrection of Yeshua, life out of death, seeing it in the stars, and I think his body was a perfect type to help him understand. You know how God will deal on many levels and give us pictures and things to help us understand? Abraham's body is almost as good as dead when it comes to reproducing. Sarah, Sarah's body is going to be that same way. By the time they give birth to Yitzhak, it is a miraculous birth. We know that. They were 90 and 100. They were past the childbearing years. Sarah was all dried up, okay? Her time every month was gone. You don't get pregnant without that. It was a miraculous birth. So Abraham's own body, Sarah's too, was really a, a picture of life that's going to come out of death because he's going to give birth to a son. He's seeing it in his own body. He's seeing it in the stars. He's got God narrating and telling it to him and is being told to us in other places in the scripture so that we get the eyewitness testimony given to us so that we can believe it. Look now with me at Yochanan, John 8, 56. John 8 and verse 56. John 8.56 says, long ways down my tablet. John 8.56, your father, oh, this is the one speaking now is Yeshua Jesus, okay? If he ever lied, he is not God. God is perfect. God never lies. Every word that came out of Yeshua Jesus is truth. Remember, he said, I am the truth. So if, if he's not telling the truth here, it's all over, okay? But we know he's never caught in a lie. He's never disproven. That proves he is who he says he was, and he declared he and the Father were one. He declared his deity with God the Father, and he declared he was the Son who would be born in human flesh to take away the sin of the human flesh. John 8, 56 says, Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and he rejoiced. Okay, when did Abraham see Yeshua Jesus' day and rejoice in it? That would be like me saying, I see Yeshua Jesus' day and I'm rejoicing in it. And you'd laugh at me and say, you weren't alive 2,000 years ago. You don't look old enough. You may look old and shrivelly, but you don't look 2,000 years old. I'd be called out for that. But God, but Yeshua Jesus said Abraham saw that day. Well, he didn't see it like I see Mathena in the room here and I see you in, in Zoom there. He didn't see it in that sense that Abraham was alive walking on this earth at the time of Yeshua Jesus, but he saw his day in the stars. He saw the story as it would unfold. He saw that this is a period of time marching down. Now remember what I've taught you before? From God's view, it's already done. From beginning to end of our human existence, he's seeing it all, he's over it all, he orchestrated it all. It's like the Rose Parade. Remember, <clears throat> if you sit down on the, on the street, you see what's right in front of you. And a mile later, someone who's sitting down there will see the start of the parade at their time when it starts in front of them. But if you could go up in a helicopter and hover over that parade, you could see the beginning and you could see the end and you could say, it's, it's complete. I see it all. It's all happened. It's all there. That's what God is showing, that when we get up out of our existence here and we look at it in the stars, we see the complete of it. He saw his day. He saw there's going to be all this that happens, then Yeshua comes, Yeshua dies, Yeshua raises from the dead, <coughs> then there's more time again, and then here comes Yeshua back to rule and reign. He sees all that, and he sees all the way to what we see in Revelation that gives us eternity future that we just studied. Abraham could see the whole plan laid out. God's plan of the ages is entirely put in the stars. Is that not amazing? Is that not fascinating? Yeah. But is that not just like our God? To do it in such a, a magnanimous way to reach mankind. You see, he didn't condemn man all the way up until Yeshua Jesus came. He gave man from Adam a chance to, to, to see it, to understand it, 
and to believe in him so that they could be saved. So no man can ever say, well, I lived at a time when there was no witness, there was no testimony, there was no way I could know. Now, God put it in the stars. God put it in his creation, and he put it in many forms in his creation also. We're just looking at the creation of the stars at this point. And this would answer the question, then, how did Enoch know? How did Jude, Jude know to say Enoch saw? Let's go to Jude. It's the book just before Revelation. It's one chapter long, but I'll warn you, if you're on a tablet, put in the chapter 1, because if you just put in the book name, you won't find it. Verses 14 and 15 say, It was also about these people that Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, okay? So you've got Adam, then you've got Adam's son, grandson, great-grandson. You go down seven times, seven levels of generations, and you come to Enoch, okay? So, about these people that Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they've done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What he's saying is he saw all the way to judgment. He saw his return, his millennial reign. He saw the judgment that comes when they stand before God also. He saw all of that, okay? Enoch only lived seven generations down from Adam. I don't know how many thousands of generations we've got now past Enoch, but he saw it. How did he see it? The same way Abraham saw it. He saw it in the stars. God taught him. Uh, Rosa, <coughs> you unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, what book was that? I didn't hear it. What book? Oh, um, I think you want John 8:56, or you want Jude. The no, book, or Jude, the book called Jude. Jude, Jude. Yeah. Jude, Jude is yes. that little one page just yes. before the book of Revelation. Yes. And it's, one, it was 14 and 15. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, Enoch lived before the flood of Noah. He lived hundreds of years before Moshe wrote what we call the books of Moshe, the first five books of the Old Testament. So, and that you can read of in Genesis chapter 5. You can get the history. You can follow what I'm saying and prove me. So, I think we have very clearly that God declared it. God narrated it. God put it in the stars. And God, by the way, was the narrator. Who was the one narrating? Who was the one telling it? It was God. God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He talked with them. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that they saw the gospel in the stars because they didn't know a need for the gospel in the stars until they sinned. But what I meant was God had that relationship. And from early on, from our first patriarchs, we see it didn't skip a beat. God took care of Adam and Eve by, by covering them with the skin, shedding the blood, showing them the picture and telling them. And we know that it carried on from Adam and Eve because we know they had three sons that are named. You know, the, the ones that are believed to be twins, Cain and Abel, whether they were or not doesn't matter, but the third son was Seth. And we know that it, it said out of Seth's sign, Seth's line, try that three times fast, that they were called the sons of God. They had faith in God. We know that Cain went away, that Cain did not believe. He murdered Abel, Abel because he did not believe. And we know that he had hardened his heart against the Lord. So we see the difference right there. But Cain, Cain was given a chance to turn around, to repent, to change his ways before worse would happen to him which tells us God had gotten him the gospel message. He knew. He was choosing to reject, but he knew. Of all, Abel was choosing to believe and do what he needed to do to show it. He brought a lamb sacrifice, and the story goes on. So without missing a beat, God's never had a time a human being, even one, could say they were without a witness. It's there. And when you respond to the light, God will give you more light. God gives everyone an igniter. And as long as you respond to ignition, then he will give you more light and more light till he brings you along. He brings it to every walk of man. I don't care if you're a fisherman or if you're a scholar. 
I don't care what occupation you take, scripture can relate to it. He takes it to the entire world. He doesn't say it's for the rich, for the famous, for the high and mighty, for those who are right, for those who do enough works. No, he said it's freely given to all. He gave it to every single one, and we've already read how Abraham didn't earn it. He didn't work his way into it. It was freely given. To this day, it is freely given. All you have to do is accept the gift. It's That's free. it. So it's easy. free. It's so, so easy, easy that sometimes people will they, trip over their own two feet. Yes. You can offer a group. You can hold up a bill and say, the first one to come take this is theirs. And you'll watch almost without exception, the majority of the people freeze. They don't move. Finally, there's a few brave ones that, that scurry and one gets there faster and gets the prize. Sadly, that's what I see. God puts it out free and the majority of people freeze. They don't do anything. They don't move. They just sit there and they let it pass by. Heartbreaking. Sad. The beauty, beautiful thing about God's gift is it's not just one for one. It's one for all. Remember the lamb for the world. I think I saw a question. Am unmute yourself. Yeah, I know we're not used to Zoom. When we are used but, to it, we'll quit. <laughs> we'll you're quit. not. You're not telepathic, I guess. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> um, I help me, um, and I'm sorry to ask you to repeat if you. But I'm help me understand how we go from Enoch. Uh, knowing, being able to see all the way to judgment through the stars <laughs> with, that, um, that God said to Abraham, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So that could be connotated that, that God was showing Abraham that his descendants, the number of them, that they'll be numberless. But I'm trying to, okay. I'm trying to. I discounted. The, I, the, I, let me judgment. stop you right there before you go to the second part of your question. I discounted that. When does believing in a number, a number of offspring, make you righteous? Righteousness is only believing in God's eternal work of salvation. So it cannot mean. A number. It has to have one of those fuller meanings of the Hebrew word that you're believing in a narration, in a story that is declaring, that is telling. So right away we're, we're stopped from the fallacy of believing that Abraham believed he was going to be a big family and it got him saved. No, it didn't. Nobody ever gets saved apart from believing in Yeshua Jesus. So right there it discounts that part. Now, the other part you're asking, how did he see all of this? Well, you want all our lessons in one day? <laughs> As we go through it, I'm going to take you and show you the constellation that showed he was to be virgin born. I'll show you how they knew when he was oh, okay. virgin born. Okay. I'll show okay. you. We will go through the astronomy, and we okay. will see how he saw all of this. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's fine. I'm sorry. I just thought no, I missed something. That's good. Uh, if it's not clear to you, it's not clear to others too. And we want it to be clear. We want it to be able to be fully understood. That's why I'm taking so long in the introduction. Because if we don't lay down the foundation, it's the same way that if you don't teach children uh, um, addition and subtraction and teach them well, they will never be able to multiply and divide. But once they have that foundation and then they can move up, then they can take it to trigonometry. You know, they can take it to the vastness, but they no, have to have. No. <laughs> okay, not everybody can mathematically do that, but you get my point. We've got to have this foundation, so I don't mind going over it again. If it's your introduction to it, it's already mind-blowing and it's hard to absorb it all. But they saw clearly, they saw the... The overall view. They got a bird's eye view. Now, like I said, I don't know how long it took God to show Abraham, but I guarantee you he highlighted the part that spoke of Yeshua's life because that's what was going to bring righteousness to Abraham 
was believing that day's coming. Okay? If I promised you I'm going to be there, I'm going to come see you, where are we, April? I'm going to come see you on April 30th. Okay? Can we um, turn that down? Oh, thank you. Sorry, it's, it's competition for me. Oh, okay, thank you. We got the chicken dance going here, and I couldn't talk over it. She was, she's so intent on the study, she's not hearing it. Okay, if I told you that, and I promised you, and I let you down, then my word is no good. God showed there's this day coming, and he promised it, and he delivered and it is good. He can always be counted on. I love the story of the little boy that was promised by his grandmother. She was going to send him a stamp collection for um, Christmas or whatever it was, birthday, whatever. And time passed and it didn't come and it didn't come and it didn't come. And it was really troubling him. And he said something to his mommy about it. And she says, well, you know, grandma might have forgotten. Well, that really troubled him. You know, he was looking forward to it. He didn't want Grandma to forget, and he didn't want to ask Grandma again. So he didn't know what to do, and he thought for a while, and he thought, I'm going to write Grandma a thank you note for it. He was on faith believing Grandma wasn't going to let him down. And so he wrote to Grandma, thank you for the stamp collection you've promised to give to me. And she immediately sent back a note and said, dear grandson, I did not forget, but what I got what what was sent to me was not a good it wasn't what I expected so I sent away for something better and I'm waiting for it to come and then I will send it to you but I love that picture he had such faith in his grandma he thanked her before it happened the people looking to the cross had such faith in God they thanked him before it happened we look back and we thank God in faith believing without seeing it the only ones who saw it were the ones who lived right there then. It's a great faith by sight. Yes, it's a greater faith when you cannot see, but you believe because God, and I'll use the word, declared it. He told okay. it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry to take up a little bit more time. Could you just one more time repeat that we, we, never, um, we never get redemption by way of a number, because we must believe in... There is no... There is did you no, say... Go ahead. Go ahead. That, so we must believe in... Did you say a picture or an example? No. Where did you take no. there? We must believe in the name of Yeshua. We must believe that Jesus saves. There is no other name under heaven whereby man must be saved. The only way we are saved, the only way we are counted righteous, the only way we get salvation is believing in... Jesus in Yeshua. Okay. Jesus, yeah, that's it. There right. is no so other way. Help me, help me see how we get His name. I'm, I'm, st I don't know. I'm stressing over this, but how we get His name with, uh, with, with the, with the number. Okay. I'm trying to because it's number. not a number. You have to let go of that. See what's wrong is you've been taught so long to look at that verse as t talking all about the numbers. That word is better translated, not count one, two, three, you're going to have a big family. That word from the Hebrew is better expressed by saying declare, narrate, recount, tell. What other words did I give you? I gave you a whole slew of words. That's the better explanation than the word count, because count makes us think one, two, three. No. Okay, so no. declare, if we, if we declare... Yes. The, the stars. Yes. Then yes. we're believing. Right. When you when you declare the stars. Descendants is and how does that graduate okay. to out our of the savior? out of the seed would come the savior would come the seed that Galatians three sixteen tells us is Yeshua Jesus. So by him declaring, by him telling, by him narrating. Oh. He is narrating that out of Abraham's seed comes Yeshua Jesus, who would redeem the world because he would shed sinless blood.
for a salvation. The, the declaration of what declare what can take away sin is sinless blood and nothing short of it. The blood of bulls and goats would cover the sins showing they're believing it. They're doing the picture to show they're believing in the coming sinless blood of the Lamb of God that would be shed for total removal of sin, not just the and where, where are we getting sin and blood in this declaring the stars? The stars are going to tell that story. They're going to tell the story of the seed. The seed is Yeshua, Jesus. And those are coming lessons? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. All right. I'm Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. I think as you do go on, it will become clear to you, and you will understand. Okay. Right. But, but the Thanks. big hang-up is you've got to let go, and not just you, any of you who are struggling with it, you've got to let go with this. Abraham believed he'd, be a, he'd have a big progeny, and it, it and it declared him righteous. That never okay. does. That never does. And oh. I think you all agree with that. The only thing that declares us righteous is not our works, not anything that we do, not having a big family. The only thing that declares us righteous is Yeshua Jesus putting his atoning work on us. And that's okay, it. thank thanks for the extra time. And I'll just sure. be patient. Sure. And I this is so great. I'm just so anxious. <laughs> And, and as we get going, as we get going, I can give you a few little tips. Virgo speaks about the virgin. You can see that. Um, I'll tell you one I love. Taurus, the bull, talks about his returning to rule and reign. Why I love that is at that time my mom was driving a Ford Taurus, and it hit her one day, and she says, I'm driving a car that's declaring the Lord will return and rule and reign. And she left it from that day forward. So it's just things in my mind that made that stand out even more. But see, we're going to go through that. And if I said a couple of names that you recognize, you're going to go, oh, oh, wait a minute. Isn't that astrology? No. Remember, Satan counterfeits. He takes what God does and he tries to fake it on his own. God's a triunity. Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist to make up a trinity. But are they three and one and all equal and, and all one, one and all and all in one? No, they're not. He falls short. He can't do it. So he's smart enough to see that God put the gospel in the stars. So what's he going to do with that? Leave it alone for people to understand the truth and get saved all through time? No. He's going to have a hissy fit. And it takes him just as far as Genesis 11 to show us he had that hissy fit and what he did with it that's still haunting us to this day in the astrology of the occult that we have nothing to do with. Now, I just tipped my hand into our next lesson because we'll get to the Tower of Babel. We'll get to Genesis 11. I'll tell you what that tower really looked like. And no, I didn't see it, but I have the understanding from the depth of the meaning of the words in the scripture that will, I believe, reveal it to you, and you'll see and understand also. But here comes Satan. Oh, no, God's done this. I got to do this. The counterfeiter. The counterfeiter. That's all he is. Copycatter. Copycatter. And he does lousy copies. He does such a fake job. But you know what the sad part is? Is he'll weave just enough truth in there that a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want the worship. I'll make these declare me. They're going to follow me. They're going to worship me. And that's what he's been after from the get-go. That's what caused him to fall was that pride. And we're going to see he was at work in the garden. We know that. We won't go into that in detail because that really doesn't relate. But we're going to see how alive and well, sadly, he was on planet Earth at the time of Babel. Genesis 11. We still got a whole Bible to go. <laughs> and he's already, oh, but he's done. And you will see the, the ramifications come out of it all the way to today. So, uh, but that's coming lessons that will give it to you, that will explain it. Um, I don't want to give all the nuggets away, but let me tell you there's a nugget coming. Did you ever wonder how the wise men knew it was his star? Did you ever wonder how the wise men knew when to come? Oh, but wait a minute. The wise men missed the stable. They didn't come to the stable. Hmm. Well, guess what? We've got all this in the stars, and it's fascinating. How did the wise men get that knowledge? <clears throat> I'll tell you that too. I think we have the answer. The star too, the yeah, and how did they know that was his star? Where did they get it? 
I'm not going to answer that today. I'm going to make you come back to other classes. <laughs> I'm going to leave you on those cliffhangers. All right, the ball. Yeah, we're almost out of class time. Any other questions? Okay, let's go a little bit further. I will cut us at 345. I am watching, but let's go ahead. We usually go to 345 anymore. And we started late today. My fault. I'm sorry. But uh, um, let's see. Okay, I gave you all of this. Um, I bring my notes because I can't hold it all and remember in my mind, so I just want to make sure I gave you all of that. Okay, so I think where we were, well, okay, let me give you just, just because it is what we're talking about right now, so it is good to say it. Let me give you a little bit of astrology versus the Bible, okay? And I'm hoping my language is very clear over the the zoom land and by the way too um i'm i'm going to try to find a way to put a map of the stars into your hands so if you are someone that is a little outside of my normal and i don't have an address or an email or something for you please connect with me so that <clears throat> i can i think if you guys can have this in front of you it's going to help you hold on to what i'm saying um, the only other way to do it is for Roger to take over and make my screen a PowerPoint, and we can do that. I don't get to see you anymore, so you'll have to holler for a question. We can shoot it out on the phones. But, but we might be able to do it on the phones, but that's so tiny. Yeah, but then they can blow it up. They can blow it up. We could do it both ways. You could get it on your phone. You could get it in, in a hard copy. Um, and we will put it on the screen from time to time, but I'd like you when you're studying away from the, my screen also to have it. So do get in contact with me if, if I don't already know your info. Yes, Rosa. Yeah, couldn't you email it to us and then we could get it, we could make a copy of it with our copy machine? It, yeah, I believe I can do that. So if I have your email, you're in good shape. But if I don't and I need to snail mail because you don't do email, I want, to, I want to get it off. I knew you wouldn't need it today. I'm not sure how fast. It would probably be one more class before you do need it. But uh, by then, it would help. Can you email through your phone? Uh, yeah, I'll do it through my computer because it's easier for me. It's a bigger screen. But, but okay. yes, it'll come to you. You know, however you tell me, it'll come to you. And I'll put okay. out a text to those who are on that telling them to, to tell me you know, how you want me to get it to you. Okay, those in person, obviously I'm gonna hand it to you. So, and by the way, anyone's welcome. If they're not afraid of us, <laughs> they're welcome in the living room if you live within distance. But again, let's look at the difference between astrology and the Bible, because I don't want anyone going out and saying, Rochelle's teaching us astrology is good. Mm -hmm. I never am and I never will. And I will tell you, don't even read your horoscope in the newspaper. Just don't open the door to Satan's occult and to his evil. And it's not right yet. It's not correct right anyway. No, no. But the definition of astrology is the belief that the destinies of the nations and individuals are determined by the relative positions of the stars. And you hear people say that, oh, it's, it's in my stars, or it's in the stars, or the destiny. Oh, I didn't, yeah. you know, I didn't have a chance. This is what they'll say. I run when I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and so she runs when she hears it. Western astrology is what we're most familiar with. That's the 12 signs. It's the 12 houses that, that goes through one year. It's also known as the zodiac. You will hear me talk about the zodiac because the zodiac is the sun's path through the stars in a year. And so you will hear me use that name, but I'm not referring when I'm using it, and I'll make it clear, I'm not referring to, oh, go believe in astrology and what it's saying. There's even an oriental astrology that has 12 signs corresponding to 12 different years. You have to go a whole year to get through one of their signs, but we're not even gonna worry about that because that's further out there too. Western astrology, the earliest form was connected with the worship of the stars. The stars were being consulted. The stars were viewed as having power over man because the stars were assumed to be gods. Okay? Now, this is the reason why God destroyed the Tower of Babel. And I'm not going to go into that at 338. I won't stop this on time if I do. But I'll come back to this. I'm giving you a little head start to next week now. We'll look at the Tower of Babel, Genesis, Bear Sheet, Chapter 11. We have archaeologists who have discovered what was a ziggurat, 
um, or an astrological tower on top, which the priests could conduct the viewing and the worshiping of the sun, the moon, and the planets with it. Okay? We're going to go away from the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. That isn't what they were doing. Oh, let's build it all the way up into heaven. Let's build a beanstalk. That isn't what they were saying. And I'll show you this. I'll, I'll bring it out from the original and the archaeological finds. That what they had at the top of what they built was replicating the stars. It was a worship of the gods, the stars. Okay? Remember, what does Satan do? He counterfeits. What's innate in man? Uh, wanting to worship something. So, okay, I don't want them to worship God. I'm going to get them to worship a false God that I'm behind. So, in essence, they're really worshiping me. And the battle is on, and it continues to this day. So, we're going to learn where they learn about these gods. I mean, I can't take you all the way back to the very, very, very beginning, but I can get you back to Egyptian time. Um, I think many of you know the god Ra, which was the sun god. That was one that they were very famous for. But remember the ten plagues? They were after Egyptian gods. You know, the, the, when the plague was on the frogs, the frogs were worshipped as gods. Now all of a sudden they're squishing their gods under their feet because there's so many they can't stand, they can't take a step without squishing them. And they're grotesque, they're coming out of their food and out of their their wash areas and yeah, you know, frogs, one of the, one of the um, plagues. Yeah, okay. That was an Egyptian Egypt god. Days. That was an Egyptian god. Chris, now, we had a plague of locusts not too long ago too. She's saying we had a plague of locusts not too long ago too. Yes, but we're going to see how what I'm saying is, you know, these were, it came right against these false gods. Because man from the beginning wanted to worship. Let me, let me, I'll come back to Tower of Babel next week. But in just a couple of minutes, let me, let me bring this thought out to you also. Remember the golden calf that was, they formed when they came out of Egypt. They melted down their gold. They put it into a mold. Aaron helped them. Aharon, the high priest, helped them. Of course, he wasn't high priest yet, but still he was in a priestly role. Anyway, um... And he tells Moshe, oh, we put the gold in the fire and it just popped out. <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> but think a little past golden calf. What's a calf grow up to be? Bull. Okay? So we really have a young bull here. We have a golden bull and we have the worship of the bull. Now when I show you the truth, I already told you about it. Taurus is one of the signs in the astronomy is given the bull as it because the way the oh, yeah. stars align but in God's astronomy is teaching the second coming of the Lord it's not teaching worship the bull but Satan pulls them down short gets them to worship the bull instead of the God who created the stars to tell his story see how it he twists. See how he takes a little bit of truth, sugarcoats his lie, so you'll swallow it. And I don't mean you. You're all smarter and brighter than that. And you've got the Lord to guide you. I mean, no such okay. thing as a golden bull, so it has to be an artificial one. I mean, a oh, real live animal is it's a, not golden. No. It's not golden. No, but, it has to be artificial. But ask me this question Was there an Egyptian astrological god? That was a bull? Yes. So what were they accustomed to? They were singing around them. They came out mixed company. The mixed company came in with their, brought their gods with them. They had put faith in the true God, but I think what they were doing, and this is my, my opinion, okay, I make that clear. I think they were just adding the true God in with all the other gods. They weren't seeing that, no, there are no other gods. There is only one true and living God, mm -hmm. and this is the one that they needed to believe in. We see all the time when Israel got in trouble, it's because idolatry was brought in. Solomon Shlomo has all these foreign wives. He wants them to fill at home, so bring your little God. Make your little um, altar, you know, your shrine. And, and he had gods all over the land for them to worship. And then you wonder why Israel fell into idolatry. It was all around them. It, 
so sad, so sad. But again, the degree man goes to to want to worship and not worship the one true and living. There's only one that's alive. Okay, Buddha is a statue. They will put food in front of that statue. They believe that that statue is going to eat that food, and if somebody eventually throws that food away. Never once has that statue come to life and eaten that food all over the world. It's never happened. Even though he looks but, like it. <laughs> even though he looks like it. <laughs> he's got a fat belly. But he's not alive. If you can make it out of stone, out of wood, hay, whatever you make it out of, that's your hands creating. That's not alive. You didn't create life. You created a, 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 a replica. You created a... a inanimate object the only one that has ever been alive is the god <coughs> who calls himself the one true and living god the the mormons have to be high up in the temple there's four bulls up there and you have to be high in the temple to get up in there and worship those bulls and there you go who are they worshiping god no, no. they're worshiping the bulls where did it come from to get up there you have to be high to, and where did that come from that where did the height why are they up there what's it smack of do you see the tower of babel in that i certainly do i see it following all the way down they really worship but, bulls in part of their yes but that's that. well then the normal people down here normal I shouldn't say that, but you know, the ones that are not in the secrets, the peons, the peons <laughs> they don't know that. If you told them that, they'll deny that because they don't know because they, they haven't been brought into on. the secrets. They, they haven't been they able to get, get up, that high up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And by the time they get that high up, they've swallowed the lie. Yes. Uh, one girl, I was seeing it. Loud. School. Loud. Huh? Loud. So they can hear you on Zoom. A friend of mine I, I knew in high school, she was a Mormon and she took me to church with her once. And we're sitting in there, I'm looking at it, third about Joseph Smith and all this kind of stuff, and then it goes through this whole thing, and then it's over with. And then they said, now the regular congregation gets to go off this separate room, and I can't go with them. And I asked her why, she goes, because it's, it's another level that they worship. Right. I'm going, well, that doesn't make sense. Right, and you've got to get up to certain levels before you get to the inner secrets. Yeah. The only thing that doesn't have secrets, and I say thing because I can't call it a religion, is Christianity. Every other religion, there's secrets. <laughs> Anytime you have to have secrets, you're hiding something, you're hiding there the truth. Yeah. Christianity is wide open. It's we have no secrets. no secrets. It is open for whosoever and for all to come in, for all to study, to hear, to know. God bears it all. He holds no secrets. But uh, again, he has nothing to hide. And he is the one who is alive. So, 347, I promise you to close at 345. Uh, we'll open it to questions afterward, but come back next week. We'll talk a little bit more about this, this Tower of Babel, what it looked like, and, and why I get that they were worshiping the sun, the moon, and the planets instead of building it high, building it tall, trying to reach up into God's heaven like they were going to climb up it like Jack and the Beanstalk. Again, the same way I have to take you away from numbering, <clears throat> being counting one, two, three, I got to break some of those things that you're used to believing. So hopefully it's making sense. Stick with me if it isn't at first. I think your questions will clear up. Don't be afraid to ask. I don't mind questions at all. On topic, we need to understand. So um, we're here to learn. If it takes us a little longer to go through it, so be it. I'm not going to put us on a time schedule that we've got to be done. Okay? So I hope you've enjoyed today. I love seeing how the heavens declare. And, oh, you want one more little nugget? Fast, real fast, mm -hmm. real, real, real fast, because we'll go into it more later. But think about when Yeshua, Jesus, came to this earth, born in, you know, in um, his human skin. It's at night. The shepherds are out in the field. What have the shepherds seen? They see the stars. What are they teaching their children? They're teaching them their genealogical history, but they're also teaching them what those constellations above them look like. And remember, that changes. It takes a year to go through it all. So they're teaching them each part, and they're teaching it over and over and over. Now, if they've got knowledge of the gospel and the stars, now go to Luke 2. Now go to the angels coming into the stars that they're seeing, stepping out and 
Oh, by the way, the angels proclaim. Where did we hear that word today? They proclaim what? Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. What are they saying? The glory of God is, is being proclaimed. It's come down to earth now. It, they took those stars and brought it to life. Didn't, Think about that. Didn't Isn't sailors that used to navigate by the stars? Yes, That's how they yes. knew where they were. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That North Star especially is that, that focal point. Yeah. And we'll talk about things like that as we go on. But yes, the, the stars were important for different reasons also, but it shows us the truth there. And when you start seeing, just let your mind open up as you're in other Bible studies you're going through scriptures, you're going to start seeing the stars, the stars, the stars, the stars. Mm -hmm. It's going to start jumping out at you. I'm just giving you a few so far. It gets pretty exciting. So, let's close in prayer before some of you have to go, before Rhonda's little doggy has a problem. <laughs> and uh, we'll pick up next week, but I'm glad to see. I hope the enthusiasm is catching because you're in a wonderful study. That um, it, Praise God, it shows me how amazing he is. So, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to study and to learn what you put into creation, what was originally untainted. And, Lord, we pray that you bring us into all truth, that we hear and speak only what is true, that anything that is wrong falls by the wayside. But, Lord, we thank you that even if we stumble in a little point, the overall is so clearly there that your day was declared, your dying, raising, and living for us, your coming back to rule and reign for us, all of this was declared. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, thank you that you give it to us in so many forms, so many ways that we cannot miss the story, that any who has a heart to hear, to see the truth, eyes open to, to see, ears to hear it, will find you. You tell us if we seek for you with our whole heart, we will find you. Thank you for those of us who have and any who listen now or in the future who do not have, Lord, open their eyes and stop their ears. Let them yield to that little tug by the, your spirit telling them this is truth. This is the right way to believe. This is the way to come home to be with you one day, the only one true and living God. And we praise you that you are the God who was, the God who is, and the God who will be. And that your word is faithful and true. Every single word. Praise you. We say hallelujah. We thank you. And Lord bless each now as they go and bring us back together again that we might learn from your word and the astronomy that you have brought to us in it. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, mics can be open, comments, questions, shalom, bye to all who need to scoot or want to scoot.